Hello, welcome to the training Isolation in Industrial Robot Systems. My name is Tobias Pütz and I'm working as a systems engineer in the Industrial Systems Group of Texas Instruments. Today's training will cover the following agenda. First, we will talk about isolation basics and isolation technologies. Next section will be about different types of robots used today. The last section will be about isolation in industrial robot systems. Isolation basics and isolation technologies. What does isolation really mean? I don't want to go too much into detail, but in general, isolation means transporting data, or as well power, between two electric systems with different electric potential. The reason to isolate is to prevent DC or uncontrolled transient currents from flowing in between the two. Why is it needed? Isolation is needed to protect from or safely withstand high voltages that would damage equipment or harm humans. It's also needed to tolerate large ground potential differences and disruptive ground loops and circuits that have high energy or are separated by large distances. Last, isolation is needed to communicate reliably with high side components in high voltage motor drive systems like we have them in industrial robots. Some more basics, isolation versus insulation. Often these two terms are mixed up, but isolation refers to the separation of systems with different voltage levels itself, while insulation refers to the material that is used and the thickness of the material. There are different levels of isolation, functional, basic, supplementary, double and reinforced. Functional isolation just refers to the general isolation between the two systems. Basic already protects against electric shock. Additional isolation added to the basic isolation results in double isolation. And reinforced isolation is a single system, but the rating is equal to double isolation. An example for a supplementary isolation would be the coating of a transformer. Isolation is covered in different standards and norms, there are one for optical and magnetic capacitors. There are different technologies for isolation. The three most common are optical, capacitive and inductive. Optical isolation works as following. By applying a biased voltage across an LED, light is emitted and then detected across a barrier so the signal is decoupled from the current. Capacitive isolation uses the physical plate separation of the capacitor combined with a circuit that has different stages like an RC integrator, a comparator and flip-flops to extract the signal information. Inductive isolation uses two coils which are placed next to each other. Then an AC voltage is applied across one coil and the verifying electric field creates a magnetic field which in turn induces an electric field and therefore current in the secondary coil. All of the technologies have different advantages and disadvantages. An advantage of the optical isolation is that it's immune to electric and magnetic fields, but the LED suffers from degradation over lifetime. Capacitive isolation can be made very space optimized. However, it needs additional circuitry, which is more complex compared to other isolation technologies. Last, inductive isolation can be made very efficient. However, it is susceptible to magnetic fields. TI uses capacitive isolation and achieves a superior performance with those. TI's reinforced isolators use a specific architecture with two capacitors in series. This results in a combined insulation of 27 micrometer. The material being used is silicon dioxide. It has a breakdown voltage of 500 to 800 volt per micrometer. The TI devices have a high voltage rating of 5.7 kilovolt RMS and are rated for a working voltage of 1.5 kilovolt RMS for over 40 years. Furthermore, they have a low current consumption and signal is transferred very quickly within a few nanoseconds. What kinds of robots are there? If we want to split robotics into different types of robots, first there are the industrial robots, shown on the left side. Industrial robots refers to multi-axis, SCARA, Cartesian, 
Delta Collaborative or Control Robots. The control cabinet is needed for every industrial robot. Normally it is located underneath the robot or is placed next to the robot somewhere in the system. Next we do have logistics robots. Logistics robots can be as something like a shuttle, an AGV or a shelf robot which is picking things in a pharmacy for example. Logistics robots are often operating within a warehouse. They are used to carry objects around and need to have sensors for location and mapping as well for environmental sensing in case humans are around or as well to avoid bumping into any other objects. Last, we do have service robots which can be things like a lawnmower, vacuum cleaner or a pool cleaner. This training will focus on industrial robots, so those would be the ones on the left side. Industrial robots are normally fixed to a position and they are designed to perform repetitive tasks quickly and highly accurate. The subfamily of the industrial robots is the collaborative robots which are becoming more and more important. These are designed to interact with the humans. To ensure a safe collaboration between the robot and the human, these robots have a lot of sensors around so that in case they bump against an object, they automatically stop operating until they are turned on again. Isolation in industrial robot systems. Typical industrial robot system is shown on the upper right, but this picture just shows a typical robot in a factory with a robot arm. However, there are some things missing. The block diagram shows the main parts of an industrial robot system, however, very simplified. First of all, we do have the robot controller in the middle. The robot controller is like the main computing unit of the robot. It is connected to an access drive, which is controlling an inverter, which is connected to the motor. Furthermore, to the robot controller, there can be an HMI connected. To supply the motors of the robot arm, we do have a rectifier and we have the inverter. Last, the robot controller is connected to an upper control layer, like a PLC. The way you can think of this is that you have complete manufacturing systems consisting not just out of the robot, but also taking into account other machines, like a CNC machine, for example. Then you will need an upper control layer, which is taking care that the complete system is running. But where in the system do we need isolation? This is where we will talk about during the training now. If we take a closer look at an industrial robot and the systems that are inside, you can divide it into robot control, motor drive, and power section. The robot control would be the communication module, so something like Ethernet communication or also RS485. We do have the CPU board, which is like the main controlling unit, main computing unit. There are I.O. modules for analog and digital or other signals. We do have sensing modules. This can be the interface to a camera, for example. And we do have the HMI, which is also shown on the picture on the right which enables a person to control the robot directly. For the motor drive, we also do have control module for the axis itself. We do have a power stage, for example, the inverter, and we also have some position feedback. This can be an encoder or it can be a resolver. Last, for power, we do have the main power supply, so the industrial ACDC, but also battery packs. Battery packs are, for example, needed if the main supply voltage of my robot breaks down but I still need some energy to save, for example, the last position of my robot arm. For these, I also need battery pack chargers. One very important part of the robot is the CPU board. The CPU board exists in different variants. The example shown on the left side is a CPU board with the daughter card slots. A common interface for those is, for example, PCI Express. The CPU board consists of a digital processing unit in the middle, which can also be not just one, but also multiple processing units, which, especially for safety reasons, are checking each other. I will need some memory, self-diagnostics, maybe a wireless interface, clocking, output user interface, and also signal input output protection, which can be as simple like an ESD protection. Connections can be directly on the CPU board itself. So this can be the connection to the HMI, can be the connection to the upper PLC control layer, but can also be connections like CAN RS485. Another example of a CPU board is the CPU board which has a connector itself and it's then plugged onto a carrier board or a motherboard. On this carrier board, 
Other modules are then connected as well with board-to-board -board connectors like the module on the lower left side. The basic components of this CPU board are still the same, but the architecture can be a bit different compared to the one that we discussed before. However, the blocks like monitoring, memory, digital processing, clocking, wired interface and input-output protection are still valid. On the CPU board itself, there's not so often directly isolation integrated, but if the interface connectors, for example RS485, are already on the board, those can already need some isolation. However, I want to cover this more in the communication module section. A communication module can be something like RS485, also RS422, CAN or Ethernet. RS485 and CAN are also used to interface modules like Resolver, Encoder or a Torx Sensor, which are often located inside the robot arm or at least very close to the motor. Most often for this RS485 and RS422 are used and Ethernet is also used in case I have a servo drive which I want to interface. Some systems also do have CAN and RS232, however those interfaces are getting less popular. RS485 and Ethernet are used to interface motor control modules like just said or a servo drive. The upper right picture shows an example for a communication module. The basic blocks are listed below. I do have the board to board connector or as well the PCI interface. Then I do have a wired interface. In this case, as we talk isolation, this can be an isolated RS485 transceiver or also an isolated CAN transceiver. For Ethernet communication, I'm using an Ethernet PHY and then I do have magnetics later. So depending on my Ethernet magnetics, this will define my isolation rating. For the signal and input protection or output protection, I do have ESD diodes and then I do have the connectors at the very last point. RS485 or as well RS422 is a very popular interface in industrial robot systems. This is especially because of the high immunity to noise. This is needed because of the switching of the IGBTs or FETs inside the robot arms, which usually causes a lot of noise. Therefore, RS485 is often used to connect, for example, resolver or encoder, which are placed at the motors inside the robot arm. Other popular interfaces are, as said, RS232, CAN and Ethernet. RS232 is not as robust as RS485. That is why it's not used as often. The same applies to CAN. Ethernet is used to connect the robot controller to an upper control layer like a PLC or any other controlling system which is controlling multiple robots. An example for this is an assembly line where multiple robots are working. In these applications, it is necessary that an upper control layer is monitoring and controlling the complete system, so also the robot. Further inputs might be sensors, safety barriers and others. For CAN and Profibus, or more general RS485, TI offers the TIDA00012, which is a high efficiency isolated CAN and Profibus interface. For Ethernet, TI offers as Ethernet PHY the DP838225, which is based on industrial Ethernet, and it can do copper or fiber optics interface. So, what this design is showing, as you can see on the lower right, it's two implementations using the same PHY, but one using a standard electrical cable and the other one using a fiber optic cable. As I was talking already about the connection from the robot controller to the motor inside the robot arm, there is often current sensing needed or voltage measurement. For this, the TIDA00171, which is an isolated current churn and voltage measurement reference design for motor drives. This one uses the Delta Sigma modulator AMC1305. Last, for driving the IGBTs, there's the TIDA195, which is showing an isolated IGBT gate driver evaluation platform for three phase inverter systems. TI offers a huge variety of different parts for robot systems. More specifically, to the interfaces, there are parts like the ISO 1176, which can be used for Profibus or RS485 which is also available in full duplex and different voltage versions. For CAN, there's the ISO 1050, which offers a high isolation rating of 5 kV RMS. As discussed for Ethernet, 
There's the DP83822, which can do 10 and 100 Mbit and is used for copper and fiber optics. If higher speeds are needed, there's the DP83867 available, which can go up to 1000 megabit. In some systems, there's also LVDS needed as a transceiver. This will be the interface to a camera module. For this, TI offers reinforced isolators with a high voltage rating of 5.7 kV RMS, as explained at the beginning of this training. For evaluation or a faster design, TI offers the TIDA00330, which is a reinforced isolated LVDS transceiver reference design. Every robot controller offers different I.O. modules. Typical I.O. interfaces are analog and digital, safe and non-safe, and isolated and non-isolated. So what does it mean? Analog or digital, or as well counting modules, which is a specific variant of a digital module, are modules that are used for evaluating different signals from sensors, motors, or as well to check or to turn on off other peripherals of the robotic system. As just said, they exist in safe and non-safe variants and can be isolated and non-isolated. Again, those are often realized as slot-in modules like the one shown on the picture. The following block diagram shows the typical parts or blocks of an analog I.O. module. Very importantly, if isolation is needed, and on this picture, the power can come either from the already isolated side or from the non-isolated side. If it's coming from the non-isolated side, so in this case from the right side, I do need an isolated DC-DC power supply. For signal isolation, I can use, if I have for example an SPI interface, standard 4.1 digital isolator. The main digital processing unit, which can be an MCU and MPU, is connected then to an ADC over the isolation barrier, which can sense multiple analog inputs. Those can be multiplexed and amplified before, if needed. For the analog outputs, the MCU is connected via SPI to a DAC, which can do voltage and current outputs, or if needed, there are also parts available which can do a voltage-current transformation. If a high accuracy is needed, those systems may have a reference inside. Depending on the complexity, there are also further things like monitoring, clocking, or as well a user interface. For connecting to the main computing unit, I might need an ASIC or ARM or signal repeating in case I suffer from losses across the signal connection. For analog input modules, TI offers multiple designs. For example, the TIDA 550, which is a dual channel to channel isolated universal analog input module for PLC. This design can be used for sensing multiple inputs like voltage, current, or as well temperature. In this case, RTD or thermocouple and the RTD in different configurations like 2-wire, 3-wire or 4-wire. Another input-output combination is the TIDA170, which has four channels for current or voltage sensing and has a calibrated accuracy of 0.1%. The outputs are two channels for current or voltage. Another design showing a channel is the TIDA01333, which features TI's new ISOWAT 7841, which is an integrated transformer and SPI in a single chip. More details about this part will be shown later. Last, there's the multi-channel analog output module, which is just using a single DAC and a multiplexer to realize eight outputs. All of the just showed designs feature isolation and offer a quick start for design. Next, I want to talk about digital I.O. modules. The block diagram shown here is a typical digital input-output module. As for the analog I.O. module, I do have signal isolation and isolation, isolated DC-DC power supply in case I do need isolation. Especially inputs are often there in a huge amount. To be able to process all of these, I often use a serializer for the incoming signals so that I only have, for example, again an either SPI communication across the data isolation. This reduces my part number count massively. The same applies for deserializing if I want to switch on or switch off other modules. For digital input, TI offers the TIDA17, 
which features one of TI's isolator and a digital input serializer, the SN65HVS885. Furthermore, the design features eight channel digital inputs and is tested to IEC 61000 for ESD, EFT and search. For digital outputs, there's the TIDA00183, which is an 8 channel 24 volt high side switch digital output. Block diagram of the design can be seen on the lower right side. For I.O. modules, and especially for isolating the power, TI offers different parts featuring different power topologies. First, there's the very easy to use push-pull topology, where TI offers the SN6501 or SN6505. Push-pull is a very easy to use topology, however, it has the downside that it is not regulated. So whatever my input voltage is, this will get directly transferred to the secondary side. For different isolated power supplies, there's also a training available on the training portal of TI. Another easy to use topology is the flybug topology, featuring parts like the LM5017 or LM5160. Flybug is also easy to use and also offers a primary side regulated output. So not just isolated, but also non-isolated. Very well known is the flyback topology. A typical part for this would be the LM3481. Flyback has the advantage that it has low bomb count because it only needs one switch. However, it needs feedback from the secondary side. As mentioned before, TI also released the ISOVAT 7841, which is an integrated transformer plus SPI. This means two parts can be replaced by just one part. However, the output power of the ISOVAT 7841 is only up to half a watt. So this might be an option for analog input modules. For the front end, TI offers several high-performance digital to analog converters like the DAC 8775, DAC 8760. For analog inputs, the ADS 8688, which has eight channels and an integrated multiplexer, or as well for high performance, the ADS1248. For serializing, TI offers the SN65HVS88 family, and for high side switching, TI has a smart high side switch TPS1H100. Some more information about the ISOWAT 7841. The ISOWAT 7841 is a digital isolator with integrated DC power, can deliver 0.5 watt of output power at a high efficiency. Line regulation is 1%, load regulation around 5%. Speed of this digital isolator is 1 megabit per second and it has only a delay of 16 nanoseconds. The isolation rating goes up to 5 kilovolt RMS and it can support common mode transient immunity of at least 75 kilovolt per microsecond. With this, I want to finish the training. You can find further collateral on TI's robotics landing page, which is ti.com slash robotics, or as well more information on ti.com slash automation or slash motor drive. All of the shown TI designs are available on ti.com and offer schematics, test data, and also bonds. Furthermore, we do have a white paper and a blog about the topic of robotics available. With this, I want to finish the training Thank you for your attention.